Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. Oh, man, do we have a fun show for you tonight. Captain Brian Schiff is here, and we're going to have a wonderful evening of hangar flying that only Brian can provide. Before we get started, just a few things. First of all, be sure to check out socialflight.com and the free mobile apps for Apple and Android devices. We have tens of thousands of aviation events and destinations. So many cool things going on in there. And our Fly to Win Challenge is now getting closer and closer into the end of this prize period. We are giving away a Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset. All you need to do is get the app, check in at your local airport, and uh, you are entered into win. Now, if you fly to all different places, get more points for checking in at different places and different airports, then you have more chances uh, to win if you get on our leaderboard. And so uh, it's just a great way to, the, for us to help support general aviation and get all of you out there and flying. And then in addition to that, we have uh, also Social Flight's FAA Learning System, where we have a whole series of courses and videos that you can get wings credit by watching them, many of them starring Brian Schiff in them, a great educational programs, uh, all within Social Flight's FAA Learning System. If you're a mechanic, you can participate in the Aviation Maintenance Technician Program, their awards program, by watching these videos, taking quizzes at the end. And if you're an AMP mechanic with an inspection authorization, you can get your certificates for your eight hours of recurrent training through Social Flight. So it's all just there for you. And again, we are just dedicated to supporting general aviation. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Tempest Aero, another company absolutely dedicated to supporting GA. Their oil filters, spark plugs, air filters, and now fuel pumps are something that for me as a mechanic and someone who works on aircraft, I, I would not choose any product other than a Tempest Aero one. And I mean that completely separate from their support of social flight because their products are available, they are reasonably priced, and they are extremely high quality. Uh, I have really never had a problem with the Tempest product, and so uh, they are really my go-to. Be sure to uh, check them out and thank them, of course, for supporting programs like tonight. Now, on to tonight's guest. Captain Brian Schiff is an airline pilot, a flight instructor, and one of the most innovative educators in general aviation. His decades-long career has included experience with personal flight instruction, private jets, and major airlines. He's type rated in the Airbus 320 series, the Boeing 727, 757, 767, the DC-9 slash MD-80, the CL-65, Learjets, and Gulfstream 5s. It's a really impressive list. But folks, I'll, I got to tell you, I am extremely fortunate to get to spend time with some of the most amazing people in aviation and space. But when it comes to educators such as Brian, it's just so tempting to spend an evening soaking up their knowledge and, and bettering our skills and, and uh, just really getting down to learning things that we really get to sit back and just talk about their life experiences and what it is that makes them the unique individuals that they are. And so tonight, that is exactly what we are going to do. We're going to take you through some of the highlights of his logbook, uh, go into the cockpit, behind the scenes, and uh, just get to know a little bit more of my favorite airline captain. I'm absolutely thrilled to call him a close friend, so sit back, grab some popcorn, and buckle up as we push back from the gate and taxi for takeoff. Please welcome to Social Flight Live, Brian Schiff. Hello, um, Brian. Oh, hey, I'm checking in on my Social Flight Live app here. I'm, I'm, hang on. <laughs> I want to win. How you doing, Jeff? <laughs> you're, just, you're a little busy with the Fly to Win Challenge right now? Well, I want, yeah, every time I watch your show, it reminds me, oh, I got to check in. So I got to, you know, this, my house is in my office is, itself is an aviation location. So I get to check in at home. <laughs> I, I would make it that, but then all of a sudden you'd have people outside your door, like, uh, and, and maybe helicopters on your front lawn. <laughs> That'd be okay. I I would enjoy that. <laughs> Sometimes I so, think I already do. So thank you again for taking time uh, to join us here on the show. Uh, as I said during the intro, you and I, I get to sit back and listen to your life and all these different stories just as, as routine course. And I wanted people to get to share this, to instead of just picking your brain and learning things, 
And so um, you have truly had an epic career. Can you start with just a really just 30,000 foot overview so people kind of understand where who you've worked for and and what you what you really did what you do now and then we can dive into some of those cool stories sure i mean i'd be happy to do that uh before i do that though i just want to say it's mutual hang around like you have the mechanics perspective of that knowledge and education and osmosis that can be gained information by osmosis just hanging around with you i wind up asking you questions about my airplane and you answer questions like things i've never thought of and and so that same perspective from a pilot and a mechanic talking together boy if we could just get more pilots talking to mechanics uh especially when the pilot is a mechanic then they can mutually offer things to each other and i think that's what we've done and i think that's really cool um you know as far as you know being on your show you've had what jack pelton robert hayes treat williams you've had nasa astronauts rod machado uh, my favorite flight instructor, Barry Schiff. Every time you say Captain Schiff, I think Dad's going to be here. <laughs> um, I mean, Kevin Lacey, Mike Patey, uh, McBrien from my, I mean, all these people, so many more that you've had on your show. And I think that my, special, my fellow Social Flight Live guests would agree that based on our achievements, we're all on pretty much equal footing. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Tonight's about you, my friend. So um, well, thank you. I think I don't have so to much. study it. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry for everybody who's who's asking why Brian Schiff. He's an imposter, although he's much better looking than I thought he was. Did he lose weight? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. To answer your question, no, sorry. Uh, so the the big overview picture of my career is uh, as a young child, I was influenced by you know going to the airport one day to pick up my dad from work and seeing the thundering 747 fly overhead. And mom saying that your dad flying that and knowing, okay, I got, I got to do that. Several years it took me to build up the courage to ask him to fly. How, what do I have to do to learn how to fly? And he takes me to a cabinet with a box prepared full of things that he'd been saving for me, waiting for me to ask him that question. Uh, basically, so I got an early start. I started flying IFR first because I couldn't see past over the glare shield. So it was instruments is all I could see. <laughs> I was too short. But I flew... Basically, got my license and certificates on there basically on my minimum birthdays, you know, 17th, 18th birthdays. And started when I was 14. Seven years later, I got all the certificates and ratings and experience and set at age 21, hired by TWA as an airline pilot, which was unusual for the time. That was back in 1989. And, and I've really had a great ride ever since. I mean, it's just been fun. I've never stopped flight instructing. I've graduated to the next best thing whenever I could. So from flight engineer to co-pilot to captain or to co-pilot and wide body and then captain. And, uh, you know, there was a little bit of a setback after the merger, after 9-11. And, uh, but that setback gave me so many opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise had. So I'm really appreciative of that. I come back, I'm a captain, I'm, I'm flying out of LA and then out, now out of Dallas. And, and I've got 35 years down and nine to go. Uh, but most of my passion is with general aviation, learning more. Uh, when I learn more, I can pass on more. So that, that's the 35,000 foot over. You asked for 30,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you mentioned something interesting, which is 35 years already, and you're still quite young. And there aren't a lot of pilots out there with that. So it really does matter in aviation when you start as young as you did. Yeah, no, it really does. I mean, in, in as far as an airline career goes, <clears throat> seniority is everything. As any of my comrades will tell you, when you go to corporate flying or charter outfits, a lot of times it's merit-based. So you graduate or you're promoted based on merit and and how good an employee you are and, and all kinds of things like that, where at the airline, it's, it's strict seniority. But of course, you've got to pass and cut the mustard after that. But being young has offered me some opportunities and uh, it's going to offer me many more. I mean, if I go to age 65, that'll be a 44 year career. Uh, I see people can, being congratulated for retiring at the airline now at age, uh, you know, with like 30 years with the airline or 34 years they're retiring and I'm still going to have much more uh, as long as I take care of myself. But being hired at age 21 had its advantages. I mean, I was the youngest, you know, at the time, a flight engineer and, you know, the flight attendants, a lot of the flight attendants I'm still flying with, that was a joke. Actually, I am. <laughs> but they would come up to the cockpit with a pacifier or, you know, uh, they'd give me my milk in a, in a bottle. 
or you know they they may, they did not hesitate to make fun of my young age. The passengers would be, "Are you young enough to do this?" So I had to dye the gray hair in to make them feel good about having someone so young. Now this is commonplace. I mean, we're getting young pilots in, in the flight deck quite a bit and and routinely now because of the, the the shortage of pilots and and it's not as rare now as it used to be. But I've even had a flight attendant come up to me and say, uh, uh, "They'll feed the two pilots," and then they look at me and say, oh, "We'll be back to breastfeed you later." <laughs> but they never did <laughs> well Sorry. um i've been fortunate enough to to see some of the the pages inside your your log books uh which oh are I, and i love the you know real log books that's for sure um you know you do, as you mentioned you had a unique start because uh, it was with your dad barry schiff uh the uh, the famous the legendary barry schiff and uh they, your logbooks include a bit of a diary in, yeah. in there. Tell me a little yeah. bit about, about learning and, and getting started uh, underneath that and, and perhaps pass along some of the things you've shown me that have been inscribed in your logbook. I don't have a picture of that to show, but. <laughs> That's fine. I was frustrated. You know, I learned, I was fortunate, first of all. Many people don't know what they want to do. They go to college. They think they know what they want to do and they don't really know. They change majors. I was fortunate to have dad as, as my mentor, but not only that, but fortunate to discover something I wanted to do at an early age and not change my mind. I mean, I was steadfast and I plugged away. Although I did want to be, um, I wanted to be a, a producer. Like a, you know, I wanted to, I was going to go to the George Lucas School of Cinematography. I was into photography and I would put a slideshow together with the right music. I could make people cry or laugh, whatever I wanted, if I put the right mix together. So I wanted to do that. I thought that was fantastic to have that kind of um, control over an audience. But then I took my first flying lesson and that was out the door. Uh, so he started teaching me to fly and at age 14. Uh, unfortunately, you can't solo till you're 16. And <laughs> I was ready much sooner than that. A lot of people ask me, come on, didn't you solo? Did, he, did you do it? I'm no, I went two years. So I had 150 hours when I soloed. And I think wow. a lot of people, they feel badly, you know, if they get 30 hours and haven't soloed yet. I'm like, hey, I had 150. Don't feel bad. Did it you really see, doesn't matter. You almost yeah. soloed on the same on the same day as you get uh, as you get all your ratings if you could only get the cross country and everything else in. <laughs> right, right. But I did get, so I soloed on my 16th birthday before going to the DMV. It was important to me that I got the pilot certificate, student pilot certificate or solo before I got my driver's license, which I did. It was a big day. And then on my 17th birthday, of course, we went to, uh, uh, I, I did my private pilot check ride and uh, almost busted that. That's a different story. I did pass it. But when I was ready to solo, it was really frustrating. You know, my first landing, you know, dad wouldn't hesitate to write crunch or <laughs> there's another, uh, another horrible, you know, controlled crash. But the <laughs> instructor made a greaser. Uh, he wouldn't hesitate to write that in my log book. And I showed you that. Which which is fun to go back and look back at a lot of these things. You know, I wrote notes in there for a lot of the things that I did. You know, buzz girlfriend's tennis match went more than 25 miles away when I'm a so student pilot. Oops, yeah. How can I incriminate myself some more? <laughs> that's 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 really yeah. awesome. The, um, and so what when you decided to then you always wanted to become a professional pilot at that point. As soon as you were doing it, you were on that path. Yeah. As soon as I started flying, I knew. And the funny thing is, I got air sick. So any of you out there learning to fly who may have trouble with air sickness, keep going. It'll go away. I, I was going to come hell or high water. I was going to get past that air sickness. I did get sick when I flew. Like whenever going for a ride with dad, I, you know, if I, especially if I sat in the back, I would get air sick. And it, it's horrible. It's a horrible feeling. But it goes away the more you do it. Your body does become accustomed to it. So keep plugging away. Don't let anybody be discouraged by by air sickness. I got past that and and I knew the whole time I wanted to be a professional pilot of some sort. I wanted to be like that. Yeah. What was the path like back then? Because I think if, if you look back at the era, it was kind of like post-military people. Uh, you know, a lot, it, it, I don't think, it, as I recall, it wasn't incredibly easy for people to get into the majors uh, at that point. No, it was almost just a little bit easier <laughs> than getting into the, the major league baseball player. <laughs> You know, you, there are a lot of flying jobs out there. And I got a job flying for a construction company uh, and I was flying for Apple Computer and I flew a captain on a 206 and a Piper Aero 4. 
and I flew co-pilot on a Citation, and then I flew eventually captain in a King Air, and I started building time. If if someone asked me to fly their airplane while I was up with a student, my students knew if my pager went off, and those of you young enough that don't know what a pager, you can Google that, but that's what we had instead of cell phones, and my pager went off, their lesson was free, we're going to go land, and I'm going to go fly, you know, the bigger thing and, and log some multi-time or whatever. Uh, so I didn't hesitate to do any of that. I got a job working at the FBO fueling airplanes overnight, you know, so I worked the red eye shift and I'd have my students come in, give them ground school while I was there. Uh, you know, so it was just nonstop. I, I, I'm not proud of this, but when I was in college, I was flight instructing and someone made the mistake of telling me that you only need a 2.0 to graduate, one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and the second thing is they don't print that on your degree. Mm. <laughs> so, Anything I was doing to get a grade better than a 2.0 was time I could have been flying. Again, not proud of this, but that's what I did. So in my senior year of college, I had about 2,600 hours at age 21. Wow. And I got this letter for an interview. I don't think it hurt that my dad was flying for TWA. I think that did help me get looked at. But when I got there, I felt much better about when I finally did get hired that all our class, my classmates who were you know, in their 30s and 40s, we're comparing our credentials and I was more qualified than most of them. So that made me feel good. So it was getting an early start, knowing what I wanted to do and sticking with it. Well, uh, tell me about your transition to, uh, to jets for the first time as you're coming oh, out of some small aircraft. That was fun and challenging. And I was about, oh, I don't know, a couple statute miles behind the jet at first, because <laughs> they, they move fast, you know, and it, you're tempted at first to be in awe at how quiet and smooth this is, but the flying aspect is so much easier. I mean, they're just so much easier to fly. Once you understand the fundamentals of flying a jet, and there are some fundamentals that are very important for you to know, it was quite easy. And I found it almost, I don't want to say boring because I loved it, but I loved going back into small single engine airplanes. Um, but the jets were smooth, so capable, so fast. But I found that, you know, because they're faster, they're flying a bigger pattern. So really downwind base and final are the same amount of time. They're just bigger. Hmm. Uh, so it wasn't that hard and, and usually there was a second pilot. So I learned how to operate with another crew member, which as a flight instructor, a career flight instructor, I'm kind of used to flying with another pilot and working with two people working together as well. But it's a different concept as a crew concept. Uh, but, but it was a good transition and, and then watching many, many captains uh, pilots in command of jets, corporate jets, or even at the airline, fly a jet to its service ceiling. I think it was the best training being able to observe that from the flight engineer's seat where you just, it's like no no jeopardy. You can just sit there, watch them fly and learn from it. And I, and I got a lot out of that. Uh, pilots nowadays are getting thrown right into it uh, and they got to learn it quickly. They're not going to fly with very many captains before they are one. Mm, interesting. What, what, was your first opportunity as kind of a, a company giving you a shot at, at flying regularly uh, jets and transitioning to the left seat too? I think that would have been Apple Computer. It was actually ACM Aviation, which was in uh, San Jose, California. So I went to San Jose State and I got the job at the FBO as a line service technician, you know, fueling airplanes, marshaling airplanes. And then when uh, Apple's jets would come in, I'd be out there under the laying on the belly, waxing the belly. And I remember distinctly one day the chief pilot almost tripped over my legs when I was waxing the belly of the Citation. No, oh, it was a Falcon 50 they had. And he goes, oh, hey, Brian, I was looking for you. Are you, are you you're a pilot, aren't you? And I'm like, yes, sir, I am. And he goes, are you multi-engine rated? I said, yes, sir, I am. Um, instrument rated? Yeah, yeah, sure I am. He goes, would you mind? And I said, yes. <laughs> I didn't even let him finish. So my first opportunity, I mean, I did get to fly a Citation with someone out of Santa Monica, a friend of a friend, and that was fun. But the first regular flying I did was when Apple finally asked me, hey, first of all, we need you to go get the Arrow, go do this. And they'd give, send me on missions with the Piper Arrow. But then, hey, do you want to go in the Falcon 50, right seat in the Citation? Uh, and then that led to more flying in, in other turboprops and a construction company that let me fly there 206 because I would go anywhere, anytime. And I think that was the biggest thing is being there. Mm. Uh, you want to win the game? Show up. And I was there all the time. And, and, and if he hadn't tripped over my legs, he'd have found another pilot. So right. I think the, one of the biggest obstacles to winning this race or this game is to be there, show up, present yourself, be available. And I always said yes um, to a fault. 
Yeah. Was Apple the first time that you did you essentially make kind of captain with with, uh, with Apple with flying left seat of their jets? Uh, it was a no. It was actually a construction company that I flew for out of San Jose. Uh, I flew captain in their Aero Four, so left seat in the Piper Aero. Uh, I only flew right seat for Apple in the jets, and I was about to get type rated in the Citation uh, when TWA hired me. So I was oh, flying, okay. also flying pilot and command, left seat of the King Air C90 at that time. Got it. I, I, I recall that you did a lot of flying with Clay Lacey also. What, when was that? I, I thought that predated uh, airlines. So I was about to go to work for Clay Lacey when I finished college. He said, yeah, come to work for me. And uh, But TWA hired me first. Well, then fast forward to 9-11, the industry's mm -hmm. downturn, the merger that we had, the seniority placement, the way everything went, I wound up getting furloughed. It was that time I said, hey, you know, remember 12 years ago, you were going to give me a job. Can I, how about now? <laughs> and, and Clay was an airline guy, so he knew. And, and he's, for some reasons, he's not that popular in the industry, but in other reasons, he's incredibly popular. But what an amazing pilot to fly with. I mean, he was so, probably, my dad was tough on me. Clay was even tougher. And the first thing he said after flying with me, so when I was furloughed, I went and flew the Lear. He says, come on, let's go flying, and I'll tell you, and we'll see. It was like an interview. And so I go flying with him, and we get done, and he gave me some challenging things to do. Like he, uh, um, he pulled an engine, we're, during a steep turn, he failed an engine on me in the Learjet. And I thought I was out of trim. I, no, back that up. I thought he failed an engine on me. Well, the Learjet has a little hat with aileron, a little hat trim switch. You go forward and back or left and right. And I didn't know that. I was pulling back to trim it, but I was also pulling back into the left, back and to the left. And I was throwing in a bunch of aileron trim, unbeknownst to myself. So I thought he failed an engine on me. And I rolled out of that thing and he's like, you know, that was a very good job. I'm like, this, did you, I'm looking at the engine gauges, nothing. Uh, I'm like, what is wrong with it? He goes, well, look at your trim. You're way out of trim. That's when I learned that the Learjet had aileron trim on that little thing. Uh, and so I learned from that. He also did some an interesting exercise that I still, two exercises I still do with my students today. One is during a steep turn, I would say, all right, while you're doing this steep turn, I want you to slow down to, you know, from 110 knots to 70 knots while you're doing the steep turn. That's a fun exercise, uh, changing airspeed during a steep turn. Most everybody tries to maintain airspeed and altitude. Uh, Clay made you change during the steep turn. The other thing he had me do was unusual attitudes. Uh, he wouldn't say, close your eyes, give me the airplane. He would just say, close your eyes and fly the airplane. <laughs> you, never, you never gave him the airplane back. And so what that did was it taught me that, you know, with my eyes closed without seeing and looking at my instruments, you can't trust what you feel. And certainly, I would be flying long and just trying to keep straight and level. And if, if I did it long enough where he's like, okay, he wants to throw it and speed things up, he would just say, all right, give me about a 10 degree bank to the left. Uh, all right, start a 500 feet a minute climb. And he'd, he'd do that while your eyes are closed, which is, I got to tell you, the most messed up feeling. But it's the best way to teach um, uh, unusual attitude recovery is letting yourself get into the unusual attitude yourself by by not being able to see uh, wow he would eventually I, I, say open your eyes and it was nothing like what you expected to see i yeah. <laughs> i promised myself that i i wouldn't you know uh, i would be careful not to keep trying to get knowledge from you during this and make it one of those shows but i have to say that little tidbit of yeah. instead of the instructor putting into an unusual attitude having the having the student fly with your eyes closed and feel yeah. that and Oh my God, how powerful that is. It was a very powerful lesson, and one that, like I said, I still use today because it shows you you can't fly by the seat of your pants. Wow. You got the first part of that lesson. Out of I love that. Yeah. yeah. All right, snap yeah. us back out. Let's go back down to the beginning of TWA. Tell me about, or, or the beginning of your experience with TWA. Um, <laughs> take, us, take us back to that a little bit and, and let me know some of the stories from your uh, from your time starting up as, as a pilot then, or actually well, flight engineer. Yeah, I was a flight engineer. I mean, that's the best job in the world. Eventually, I got tired of it because you want to fly. I mean, you're there to fly, and you're watching these guys fly, and you want to fly. But where else can you get a job, you know, where you have two guys with college degrees flying you around from party to party? That's basically what it was like. 
<laughs> we're going from city to city. I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to kid you here. My first layover was, so I was based in St. Louis. I actually started out in JFK. I was based in New York. I uh, got a crash pad, got all my worldly possessions that I cared about, um, some good clothes, shirts and jeans and, and my stereo and, and some tapes. And you guys, younger guys can look up what tapes are. So I got all my worldly possessions I cared about. I'm in this crash pad, but I'm living in it. Anyway, I get my first layovers in Las Vegas. I got so much fun. I thought this was so exciting. I'm like, I literally was jumping on the bed in my hotel room and just like, you know, like no one, like no one's watching. <laughs> and now I've just told everybody. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. And as a young kid, I got this check. It was, you know, I made $23,000 a year. Oh my gosh, at age 21, that was huge. Because uh, flight instructing, I was making obviously a lot less. And, and flying for uh, Apple and this construction company was on a contract basis. So. Uh, that was really cool. I was excited about that. I got to go to the neat, neatest places, places I hadn't been before. And, and not too long after I was hired, I got based in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, flying 727s intra-European, where you know the big, the wide bodies would bring people to our big cities like Rome or uh, Frankfurt, and we would fly them in the 727 to other little cities. So I got to fly, and so I got a hotel room in Frankfurt for the whole month, basically TDY, temporary duty. I'd live there. And when I was flying trips, I would be out of that hotel for three or four days and my mom and stepdad would come take and use the hotel on those days. But I would lay over in like cities like Vienna, Istanbul, Athens, uh, Stuttgart, Rome, Paris, and just all over the place as a 21-year-old kid traveling like that. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And I got to meet some fantastic people. I got a world of experience. I was out there in December of 1989 when the Berlin Wall came down. And, and that was a very historical, momentous time to be in Germany. And I was based there. So I, you know, we would have layovers. We'd go to Berlin and we'd have a four hour sit and then fly back. So to do that, we're flying the Berlin corridor that they had. And it was a, basically a corridor of airspace, an airway between Berlin uh, and, East, yeah, there it is, in East Berlin or West Berlin, which was in East Germany. You had to stay in the corridor. It was at 3,000 feet. It wasn't a very long flight. And there was no speed limit. So we would do that typically at Barber Pole, which was about 340 knots indicated uh, at 3,500 feet. And I got to tell you, military guys get this all the time, but for an airline guy to move that fast, that low was pretty fun. That airspace was controlled by the joint forces of, you know, um, Germany, England, France, United States, and and I think Russia even had a hand in it. But we were, you you didn't know which controller you were going to get. But... I, I got very much cultured by flying out there and being a part of the Berlin Wall coming down. So we would have a four-hour sit in Berlin, and the company would give us a company van, and we would drive out to the Berlin Wall, which people were in the process of tearing down. I mean, there were uh, people out there renting, yeah, they were renting like uh, hammers so you could chip away at the wall, take pictures, and and I was there, and that was uh, one of the checkpoints. and. It's stuff that I read about in history books. It's stuff that seemed like another world away. And here I was being a part of history, tearing down the wall. There's an East German guard who um, I later shook hands with through a hole in the wall. I had my TWA pilot uniform on and I took the cap emblem off my hat. He took the cap emblem off his hat. We traded. And it was just a time when, you know, if you were to climb that wall or try to get over it, let alone be beating on it with a hammer, you would have been shot. And, and, and it's just that, that people were trapped inside that, you know, East Berlin in that city like that. It just astonished me. And that, oh, yeah. So that's that was a, near the hotel in Frankfurt in Mainz, Germany, uh, hanging out um, when I was based there. So I, on the days I was off, I hung out in Mainz, Germany, uh, toured around Germany. Uh, I visited some of the concentration camps, a very surreal experience. Um, I, I think that everybody should do that once. There's, yeah, a view of the Berlin Wall. That was no man's land. Shortly before I went out there, boy, if you were caught between those two walls, you were dead. And Mm. you could not go from one side to the other. And family members would be on each side and could not see each other. And I got to be there on, it was around Christmas time in December of 89 when they actually opened the Brandenburg Gate and let East German, you know, East Germans out. And, and, and watching them mingle, find their family members who they thought they'd never see again. Uh, this was a very impactful to see something like this and be a part of it. 
Wow. I mean, that's, it sounds like one of the great benefits of, of being a, a pilot in, an air, in the airlines and traveling the world is that you get to be there for all those moments, but also have all these special experiences with individuals. We think about just the flying, but there seems to be quite a bit, quite a bit more to it. Yeah, exactly. And I think I'm, you know, it's, it's like, I've got this, uh, picture of the iceberg back here. I use that a lot. When you look at somebody, you see the tip of that iceberg. You don't see everything below the surface, everything that they've been through. So someone might look at me and say, oh, wow, yeah, you know, you've come a long way. You've done a lot of things, but you don't know half of what I've done. I look at somebody else and I might judge them or be tempted to before I know what's beneath the surface, their experiences, their life's journey, uh, what makes them them. Uh, is everything below the surface. And, and that when you get to know someone that way, then you can have the right to judge them or to uh, draw conclusions. But I, I, I truly would like to encourage people not to judge others. I learned a lot by, by this, the more time I got to spend with different people, that what, what makes up the person that you think you see is a lot more than just that tip of that iceberg. Mm. Mm. I do have a That's story it. about that if you want to hear it. That's uh, Yeah, of course, go ahead. Um, I was flying with a co-pilot one time. This was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, something like that. We were flying along and he was making a lot of uh, off-color jokes and uh, disparaging other people, specifically gay people. We had a gay flight attendant. And, and I finally said, look, you don't know who I am. You don't know who you're talking to. And I just want to caution you. I said, look, I'm not offended. I don't have a problem with jokes, I mean, I love jokes. I think even if they're at my expense, I love a good joke. I said, but you should be careful. You shouldn't be doing that to someone you don't know. Uh, to, to my point, know what's below the surface before you, you judge or, or even tell jokes about somebody. But he was really rude, it was, it was over the line. And I called him out on it and I stopped it. Well, he wouldn't talk to me for the rest of that flight. Hmm. And it was kind of uncomfortable. It was a transcontinental flight. We're going all the way across the country, we're only halfway there. And I'm like, look, I didn't mean to upset you. Uh, we can talk and, and nothing I said could really get him out of that. He kept looking out his window, wouldn't look at me. He's doing a minimum job. And I'm like, okay, I really upset him just by calling him out on this. Um, and I said, look, okay, we had three days more to fly together. And I said, this isn't going to work. I've clearly upset you. I'll get off the trip. Or if you want to get off the trip, you can get off the trip. But I don't think if I've upset you this much, we shouldn't be flying together. This is a safety issue. And he goes, he finally talked to me. He looks over at me and I could tell he was, he was, upset. Um, and he said, look, I'm going to, I got to be honest with you. I've never had anybody call me out on that before. And I'm going to tell you something I've never told anybody before. And, and to make a long story short, he came out to me right there on the flight deck and said, look, I'm gay. And I do that to cover. And I've never had anybody stand up for the people like me, like you just did. And I said, he said, I'm not upset with you. I'm just truly moved by the fact that you did that. I don't know what to say. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Wow, I was truly moved by the fact that he was comfortable enough to say that to me, um, but that was just, that was a shocker to me. And, and so that just proved to me, boy, you got to be careful. Um, you don't know if you don't know somebody, you need to be very careful about what you say around them, uh, what you say to them. You just don't know what their experience is. Uh, and I'll give you another small example of that. We had a guy come back to work, uh, and I was a instructor. And I was going to give him his requalification. He'd been out a while, and I didn't really know why. But we, I did the typical questions. Hey, do you have any kids? Uh, and and it, it just kind of upset him. And it, well, the thing is, I didn't understand. Just asking him, do you have any kids? Well, he'd been out because his five-year-old daughter had cancer. And then she went and fought it and lost that battle. And then he was out for a while. He comes back to work. And the first thing I ask is, do you have any kids? A normal, innocent question like that. You just never know what someone's what's underneath the surface like that that ice that iceberg it's important that you you, you respect the fact that you don't know and, and that's where yeah. i i've learned that valuable lesson by encountering a lot of people who've taught me lessons that way as well yeah your experience also of course touches the lives and brings you really close to a lot of folks that that you transport that are in the back yeah um tell me a little bit about what comes to mind with that i was uh the first thing that comes to mind is a is a, a photo I took because it truly moved me. I was I was in a, I took a lot of pictures and I took a picture of a a path. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. What this was I was truly inspired by this that I'm walking back through the cabin and this spoke to me and I think 
laid into me a foundation of you have a responsibility that you need to really be aware of. And this is a lady, a mother and her child, both sleeping, obviously comfortable enough in the back of the airplane to sleep. And I was just up front telling jokes and flying the airplane and maybe being a little lighter than I should have been while in the back of the airplane, I go back and this was back before 9-11 when we could go take a stroll through the cabin, which I did frequently because I, it's about the people for me. I love flying the people. And that's why I don't fly for FedEx, even though the boxes don't complain. Um, I went back and I saw this and I thought, you know, just the fact that they feel comfortable enough to go to sleep while I'm up here flying this airplane, they're putting a lot of faith in my hands. They're putting a lot of trust. I don't want to take that lightly. And so I really took that to heart. I actually had that photo pinned up on uh, uh, tape to the back of my folder. It works every time I would go get my, you know, mailbox out of my, the stuff out of my mailbox, which was just a hanging manila folder. I'd see that. And it made me realize the trust that my passengers put in me, the faith they put in me. And when I walk up to the airport and I see them hugging each other's goodbye, what's happening is they're handing off the responsibility of their most prized possession, their loved ones, to me. And so any pilot who just thinks getting in the airplane and driving it from A to B is their job, if you're going to be a professional pilot, please do what I did. Take take into account the fact that people are handing off their most prized possessions, their loved ones, and putting entire trust in your hands. Even if you're just flying a GA airplane with passengers, no one ever asks you to see your certificate or to see your qualifications or how did you do on your check ride or, or anything like that. No one asks that. So our passengers put a lot of faith in us, and I think it's very important that we acknowledge that and appreciate it and give it the respect it's due. Um, you've seen also quite a few very, very cool things uh, from the air uh, in, in your travels. What are some yeah. of the biggest things that, that come to mind? I know you sent me a couple I'll put up here. Um, oh, my gosh. I have seen, you know, I, yeah. So that's a view. That's what the Hudson River dumping into the Atlantic Ocean looks like after a strong rainstorm in New York. So there it is, the cleaning out of New York and all that dirt <laughs> from the streets and sidewalks or everywhere. Uh, and, and that's it billowing into the Atlantic Ocean, a perspective you just, you're never gonna see that from the ground and realize what, what just happened here, all that water's coming out. And I just thought looking at that, uh, there was just a serious cleansing that went on here. Um, but I mean, I've gotten to see so many fantastic things that I think my dad put it well when he said that uh, the pilots experience a world of experiences and, and, and sights that ordinary people only dream about. And that perspective forms the bond that unites all of us because we get to see things that they don't. Now mm -hmm. that picture you're showing there is, I'm in that picture. <laughs> and you can see there's an airplane that's in Washington DC National Airport. And I'm the one that just got pushed back and about to taxi out. I'm in the left seat of that. And when that lightning strike hit, the ramper who's connected to the front, who's an intercom and standing in the wet ground, uh, that electricity went through the ground, through the water, hit him, knocked him down. Paramedics oh had to come. I'm looking at him laying down right outside my window. I'm like, oh my gosh, call the paramedics. He's, he's out. And, and the tower said, yeah, we just had a lightning strike. Stand by. The power's out in the terminal, blah, 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 blah. And paramedics come out and they're looking at his feet. We were sitting there for a while. Uh, and his feet were burned and he had to go to the hospital, but he's okay. But now if you ever are at an airport and you see that, oh, the ramp is closed because there's lightning within five miles of the airport, this is why. It's a it's a very real real thing. And having seen that, like, oh my gosh, that was crazy. But Wow, it never that, even occurred to me. It's about the people on the ground. Yeah, so St. Elmo's fire is something else that is just another otherworldly thing. and. First time I saw it, I thought something was wrong. Uh, now it's fun to, you know, with the new first officers to, as soon as that starts happening, I'm like, oh my gosh, oh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that. It's fun to, you know, explain them what it is. It's static electricity from, you know, negative charges building up the clouds when you're flying through it. They build up on the airplane and it's just like one of those little balls that you can put your hand on and all the like just, you know, little bolts come to your hand. But it's fun to tell the first officers, hey, well, just put your hand on the window. And they're like, no, no, you do it first. I'm like, no, I'm not doing it. You do it. But it's a fantastically beautiful thing to see. And sometimes it's just dancing all around. Sometimes it it will start making the nose of the airplane, the radome will start glowing and getting a bigger ball of glow out in front of it. I've seen a spear 
going out of just glowing static electricity. Um, I've in I've been in that situation, and at one point the hairs on my arm started standing up. You know, like if you rub a balloon and put it right there. Well, if you're in an airplane and you feel the hairs start to stand up on the on your arms like that, well, the back of your neck for sure go land. But when you feel your hair starting to stand up and there was like static electricity everywhere, and we were deviating around thunderstorms, uh, get ready. You're you're now a target for a lightning bolt because right after that, bam, we got hit. Lightning bolt hit the airplane, very loud kapow. Uh, airplanes are designed to take it. It went in the nose, left a burn hole about that big, went through the skin of the airplane and left the airplane in the back, uh, another hole in the back. Um, I think it, 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 our radios were fine, avionics were fine. Everything was fine after that, but it was just loud and very surprising. Uh, but I remember distinctly that wondering, boy, all this hair standing up. Another piece of advice, if you're going to get that happen, turn all your lights up, everything, full bright. Because when that lightning hits, it's so bright, you're going to be momentarily blinded, and you need your cockpit lights uh, as bright as they can be to recover from that. Wow. That never even occurred to me. Know, that is, is, yeah. It's a lot of weird things like that. Um, I've seen some – Aurora Borealis is one of the neatest things. Flying across the North Atlantic or up in Alaska, uh, up up north, when you see the, the, the northern lights are just absolutely beautiful. These lights, green and red, just dancing in the sky. And I remember flying underneath them, just kind of watching them go – over us as we're on our way to Europe. Or it's so surreal if you've never seen them. It's beautiful and surreal and you feel like you're in another world. Wow. Breaking out on top. You've done that. Flying IFR. Love it. I, I mean, I still, if I'm flying and I know it starts getting brighter when I'm in the clouds, first of all, you know when it starts getting brighter, that's where the icing is. It's at the tops usually. So get ready. You're going to get some ice right there before you break out. And then you break out. I, I start shallowing and I level off. Um, climbing out. I get out of the tops and I level off. This is a toy my dad <laughs> gave me. He brought this back from somewhere when I was like five years old. I still have it. I still play with it. Um, but I level off in the tops and I skim the tops. And, and sometimes I'll just make a PA and say, hey, if any kids back there want to see something really cool, you can see how fast we're going if you look out your window now. Um, it's hard to get people to open their windows these days because they're all, you know, <laughs> sleeping around their phones <laughs> that's cool i've seen a sunrise in the west that's something most people don't get to see and you might say how did you see a sunrise in the west brian well i didn't reverse the course or the rotation of the earth but if you take off shortly after sunset well when you climb you're going to out climb the curvature of the earth and you're going to now climb up high enough where you can see the sun again and it looks like it gives the impression that the sun is rising as you can see it come up over the curvature of the earth as you out climb it. And that's pretty cool. Flying west into a sunset that lasts about five or six hours because the sun's going west, you're chasing it. And, and you can just have a super long sunset. Uh, that's pretty cool. I've seen, I've seen the compass freak out when I'm flying too far north in the extreme northern latitudes where the compass is just kind of swinging around and, and it's telling us nothing useful. It, it just starts going nuts or it's like, 40, 50, 60 degrees off of what we're really doing. In fact, we're supposed to switch to true north in certain places up, up uh, in the northern latitudes. We can, can only use true north, and the airplanes are made to do that. Your Garmin's will do that too very easily. And if you watch my last four flight workshop, we had the some people from ICAO on there, and they're doing a study about switching everything to true north now. What, who uses a compass anymore? I mean, it's a good emergency piece of equipment, but why not switch everything to true? Right. Did right. I say fourflightworkshops.com? <laughs> I was going to plug it at the end, but if you want to plug it now, go. <laughs> no, we can we can fourflightworkshops.com talk about it at the end. That's fine. It's been a, <laughs> just because it's been a very successful program. Um, you know, fifteen thousand people signed up. Fourflightworkshops.com. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> it's any, been a lot of fun. Any other uh, kind of crazy things? Have you ever you ever seen anything unexplained? I have. And for fear of uh, – now, I haven't ever spoken with Howard Hughes or the Wright brothers, but I have seen some very interesting phenomena at night, and I, I think they're satellites, but I've seen them move in ways that you wouldn't expect to see something move, nothing that, of this world, I could say. Uh, later, it was explained to me that, okay, you're seeing a satellite in orbit, 
it leaves the sunlight, then another one comes into the sunlight. And so it looks like one, well, I don't know. Is that really what's happening? I don't know. Um, the first time I saw something really strange was going into Los Angeles at night, just south of Vegas, and I see some really bright lights, like lighting up the ground, and they're just hovering there. I mean, really bright. Well, I had a military, so to me, that would have freaked me out. But I had a military co-pilot. He goes, oh, yeah, those are the flares on parachutes is what that is. They shoot them up, and it's really bright flares to light up the area. And I guess they just hang there in a parachute for a long time to, to help with their warfare or whatever they're doing to light the area. Never seen that, but I had someone who could explain it. Um, as, as far as, you know, just seeing moving lights, moving in directions that I've not been accustomed to as recently as, you know, a few months ago. And, and you're hearing and seeing more and more of it. People, you hear it on the radio, guys are calling, did you see that? And we like, yeah, we all saw it. What was it? Well, one of those was, I remember seeing a string of, it looked like a string of stars all moving, like maybe a hundred, just one after another in a row and going right over us. And it was Starlink. I later learned that that was a star. I took a picture of it. I showed a friend. He goes, oh yeah, that's Starlink. Like, What's Starlink? I looked it up like, oh, okay. So they were launching a series of 150 to 200 satellites and they were up in the sunlight just over us because it was just after sundown. And you could see them all just, it looked like a string. I thought we were being invaded by another planet. So I've seen weird things. Sometimes they're explained afterwards and I got to think there's an explanation. But if you're going to ask me if I think we're alone, I'm going to say I would be pretty arrogant to think that we're the only ones out there. Mm. But That's I don't know. <laughs> What about, I mean, you, you, I know you really enjoy your time in the cockpit. Things have changed over the years in, in the, in the whole industry, but yeah. you guys have some fun. What, what's some of the, I guess, more G rated that you can talk on the show hijinks that you guys have done? Well, you know, it's always fun when you get someone new, like the new flight attendants, you know, it's fun to give them little tasks to do that are kind of menial or you'll tell them, Hey, look through here. We're, we're tracking on, Celestial, and you now tracking in on Jupiter. You can look in this. It's a map light. Look up there, and you can. You no, know, it's not. Look into a map light. Yeah, it, but you got it dimmed down. This so dim that it just looks like a little ball. It looks like a planet when you look inside the the map light itself. Uh, you know, here's a Ziploc bag. Go back and uh, get an air sample for us from the back of the cabin, and bring it. Just hold it up high, fill it up, and then Ziploc it. Bring it back for us so we can make sure there's enough oxygen for everybody. And they they'll look at you. Like you're not going to do it. it. You know, it's just fun to do stuff like that. I've had, uh, oh, one time flying the 1011, we have a little escape hatch, not escape hatch. It's a hatch that goes down to the lower equipment bay. And captain said, go down there and, and uh, hang out for a sec. We're going to get Susie up here and see if uh, she can find you in the airplane. Tell her to go back and look for you. So he had me hide. <laughs> I went down, you know, you don't have a flight engineer now, so you can't do these kinds of things. But I was a third crew member, and so I went down there, and he, he got her up, and he said, hey, can you go back and find Brian? And she goes, looking for me in the airplane. We're out over the middle of the Atlantic. She goes, I, I, he's not back there. I don't see him. Did you look in the labs? Uh, well, uh, there's no one in the labs. Uh, did you look in all the closets? Go look again. So she goes back, and she's looking in the closets and the labs, looking up high in the overhead, opening the overhead pins. <laughs> Uh, while she's doing that, he had me come back up and sit in my seat. So she comes back in the cockpit and uh, sorry, we can't say cockpit, the flight deck. And uh, she, <laughs> it's, there I am. And she's just like the, the look of confusion. And uh, finally, she's like, where were you? I'm like, what are you talking about? I've been sitting. <laughs> and that is mean. But, you know, you got to you got to break people in. <laughs> uh, it's yeah, and it's and it's it's gender neutral because I'll tell you in the maintenance world there was always stuff when you got a bit larger aircraft in there was always someone that would take the new mechanic and send them over to go uh, uh, you know blow into the relief tube while you were checking because tell them that we needed to check pressures or something like that. There's yeah uh, yeah, yeah it's um it's it's it, uh, there's a rite of passage I think that happens maybe it doesn't happen anymore but it used to it used to be a a way of life to say to say the yeah. least um, there is. i mean you had to be careful you know it's the hand that feeds you they bring you your meals they bring you your drinks you know you're, you're not gonna they had ways of getting even with that way <laughs> it's so much <laughs> so that i flew with this one captain who had such a bad reputation that he had me order his drink for him because he knew <laughs> that he had such a bad reputation and that was probably not gonna end well for him yeah. if he let 
them know it well, was. Well, you airline captains have a little bit of a reputation, and uh, there, there's I don't know how much it's changed uh, or still persists, but uh, let's see. Uh, uh, and you don't have multiple families in multiple cities, nothing like that. No, not that I know of. I mean, <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> No, I mean, it would be so easy with this job to do something like that if you wanted to be malicious. I, you know, I have enough trouble with one family. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. And, and, uh, there's, and no, there's no embarrassing a lot of, moments. What's that? No embarrassing moments of anything like that? Well, I have had an embarrassing moment like that. Now, I was dating. Okay, it wasn't, I wasn't married yet. I'd gone out with like one or two dates with this one gal, a flight attendant. And because it was easy for to go out with flight attendants because they're you're working with them you meet them all the time and then i met another one and i went out i went out with her too we weren't we never said we're exclusive and we <laughs> one day i'm pulling up into jfk with a big you know glass windows there and we're pulling up in the gate area and shutting down and i look up there and i can see two people both of those girls waiting for me in the gate area not talking to each other they don't know each other both in my mind, clearly they're waiting for me because back then you could check and see, you could stop your fellow crew members and see where they're going and, and check what flights they're doing and when that's coming in. And boy, that was a that that was a tough decision. Sometimes as a pilot, you have to think on your feet. Um, and I had to think quickly, how am I gonna handle this? So I did what 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 every man would do. I scurried out the back door of the you know, the D D B Cooper stairs of the 727, you know scurried up underneath the belly of the aircraft where nobody could see me through the window and went through the baggage claim and left and went home. <laughs> no good could come of me going into that gate area, even though <laughs> we weren't exclusive. I mean, so you got to be creative. I did go check my mailbox after that, and I found notes while I was out on this long trip. I found, I don't know if they're, you know, they were love notes, one from two different girls, and one was sealed and one was just folded up but both in my mailbox. <laughs> oh, wonder which one got there first. Being, this, yeah, who, who got there first? So <laughs> you, you have no choice but to be honest. At least I didn't. I mean, I'm not. <laughs> so there was some balancing. But, you know, they've said anybody who would – I'm not going to say it. It was a good joke, but not appropriate here. Um, I've all, you've also told me that you have an impressive list of celebrities that you have ended up flying. Yeah. I mean, way more than you can even just read off without using up all the time we've got. What are some of the highlights? What are some of the coolest people? Or at least cool, not, I wouldn't say cool people, but cool experiences, people you, you got to spend time with. I got to do some really neat things. And I think that, you know, that was one of the things I was referring to. When I got furloughed, I went back to Clay Lacey. I said, hey, can I still come fly with you? So I did. And it was basically an air taxi service to the stars. And I got to fly some fantastic people, and I got to know a lot of them. I mean, the best was Jay Leno. Uh, I was I got to be on a first name basis with him because he'd show up, hey Brian, and uh, you know he'd request me, and and I flew him all over the country. That that man gave so much of himself and was a good role model for me because as successful as he got, he always had time for the people who got him there, who who were his fans. One night I remember leaving somewhere in the middle of Iowa, I don't even remember where, after he, he was there doing a stand-up comedy routine uh, to benefit breast cancer. He wasn't going to take any of the money, but all the money that generated by it was going to go toward breast cancer uh, and research. And two in the morning, he shows up. There's the, we're the only jet on the airport. It's a non-towered field, and we're sitting there waiting for him. And there's a you know 1957 Cutlass old you know wagon you know, station wagon out there with these two ladies that, uh, uh, you know, Lolita and Tanqueray from the, the local trailer park. And they're waiting for Jay. They want to see Jay. And I'm like, oh, me and my co-pilot, like, okay, well, it is what it is. You know, they know he's here. They're... So he pulls up, not in the back of a limo, but in the other right seat of a pickup truck, comes out with these bags of McDonald's, not, you know, $800 catered meals on the jet, but these bags of McDonald's or pizza. He'll come up with one of the two. He hands them to me, and these, these ladies go, Jay, he's like, ladies. He walks over and talks to these ladies like they're his best friends for probably close to 45 minutes. Oh, and my goodness. I'm watching this, just going, okay, extend our flight plan. Tell them, we're, yeah, get, a, get another delay on this. And he's just talking to them. And I was, you know, after a long day, and, and we pick him up at the end of filming and taping a Tonight Show. We go to Burbank and pick him up, fly him to somewhere in the country, 
bring him back that night, get in at three or four in the morning and he'd go do a Tonight Show the next day and then it'd stand up somewhere else in the country that night. Um, the, the ethic, the, the, the way he treated people was above, um, you know, anything I've ever seen from a celebrity. Super great guy. I mean, I've flown, uh, I got to fly Tom Cruise, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I got to fly Nancy Reagan. The best, I've got another story for you if you have time. Mm, I know you're pushing the, the, the clock no, here. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Time's yours. Was, so do you ever watch the TV show Friends? No one's ever watched Friends. Right, no one's watched What is well, this show you Ross, speak of? Ross and Rachel have their, like, their one celebrity that they get a, a hall pass for if, if they ever had the opportunity, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so my wife and I naturally were watching. Is she? We're watching the <laughs> – <laughs> We're watching Friends, and I said, "Who would yours be?" And she said, "You know, she picked Mel Gibson, and that was way before he kind of got a little nutty." But um, she she was in love with Mel Gibson, and she said, "Who would you pick?" And I said, "Shania Twain." Okay, so that's fun. Whatever. Fast forward about ten years later, I get laid off. Now I'm flying superstars all over the place, and I show up to the airplane, and I'm looking at the folder, and I'm flying Shania Twain to Houston for a concert. I'm like, hmm. <laughs> So conundrum, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I called my wife. I said, "Hey, remember that that little deal we made? <laughs> that deal we made about you know if you had an opportunity." And this is my wife. I love her to death. This is who she is. She says, "Honey, if you can swing it, go for it." <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that you know what happened, but it didn't happen. We did, however. She invited us. She was traveling with one of her girlfriends, just a down-home gal. She had jeans and a ponytail on before she turned into the show gal when she got there. But she invited us backstage to watch the concert. And I said, well, we're going to have to leave early to get the airplane ready to go back home. And she's like, oh, no, don't worry about that. We'll go grab dinner afterwards. So this is where I'm thinking, hey, me and my co-pod, she's with our friends, like a double date, and I had twain. Um, this could happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> It didn't, but it was a lot of fun. It was really fun. Uh, so Tommy, anything, anything, anything else happened in or around the plane or with any of these stars? Well, you know, it was Tom, Tommy Lee and Pam Anderson. I remember flying them at a time when they were not together. <laughs> well, history and my experience on the airplane and the oscillating, well, I thought I had a pitch unit going bad on the airplane <laughs> autopilot, but it turns out they were very much together. Um, <laughs> In the back of the airplane. No door, no cockpit door, no shame. Um, do you know how much I could have made if I could have got a, a videotape of that? <laughs> you know, just. You, you, <laughs> you told me you flew uh, David Spade also. That I did was fly David fun. Spade. He was funny. Yeah, he was a riot. He, he, um, he, he brought a friend with him and we were flying him somewhere. I think it doesn't matter where. He shows up and he's got these toys with him like a little Tonka truck and a fire engine. And both of them are carrying these things. And I thought, oh, good, that's nice. They got a gift for their nieces or whatever, nephews. And they get on the airplane, we take off, we're cruising along. And I just hear some noise in the back, you know, like you're making an engine sound with your mouth. And I hear these weird noises and I kind of look back. I look back there and they're playing with, <laughs> here I am with my, you know, they're just playing, they're sitting on the floor. <laughs> Playing with the toys, and I'll never forget David Spade looks up at me when he sees me looking at him, and he's like, <laughs> like what did I just see? What, what's happening back there? Why is that? Um, yeah, that was that was weird. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I got to fly some really neat people. I, I told my daughter, I got, I don't know who this Demi Lovato chick is, but she's taking her to Vegas for something. <laughs> And my daughter just freaks out. You know, I had no idea who that was, but it was neat. I got to fly some neat people. Simon Cowell flew him down to Baja every weekend, uh, every other weekend it seemed like, because he had a place down there. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Super nice guy. Not not the guy he plays on, uh, you know, American Idol. Uh, I, uh, I I don't want to miss out on making sure we we mention that uh, uh, the flight that you did in the Middle East, because I know with your father. That yeah, is, that's one we have to get to. So can tell me that story. One of the most memorable, uh, certainly uh, unique opportunities that I've ever had. Uh, Dad has written the story, the, the, the videos on my YouTube channel, so I don't need to go into big detail. But basically, he had arranged for us to fly, uh, I think it was like around 35 general aviation airplanes from 
uh, Jerusalem, Israel, to Amman, Jordan. And we did that. And I was in the airplane with him and a Brit Norman Islander flying across the country when the jet sectional, sectional, the uh, IFR chart had a note on it that said, aircraft of Israeli registry will be shot down crossing the Jordan River. Okay. Sure, we have permission. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we had we had permission. Uh, we landed and were met by by King Hussein and his uh, son Prince Faisal. And the most unique moment of that was like, you know, I felt like Forrest Gump running into all these people. I, I'm there in a back room, an ante room, before King Hussein spoke to our group of people. We must have had like a hundred people or more. It was dad and me and King Hussein and his son, Prince Faisal, the four of us sitting in an anteroom just talking about uh, airplanes and aviation. Uh, hmm. and, and that's where I talk about how aviation transcends the differences between us. And I truly learned that there, that you go to Oshkosh, you don't hear people talking about politics or the differences between us. We have this common bond of air, airplanes, aviation, hmm. I should say, because it's not just airplanes. But that was what we had there. And when we flew to Jordan, there were Israelis hugging and meeting and talking to Jordanian Air Force pilots, the two of whom had only looked at each other through gun sites prior to this. You know what mm. I mean? And now they're, they're talking about airplanes. They all fly airplanes. They love aviation. We're talking aviation. Mm. And, and seeing how one common bond or love for something so cool like aviation brought everybody together like that was, was a fascinating experience, but just surreal to be in a back room with King Hussein and, and, and Prince Faisal together with my dad as like a couple of father sons just talking aviation. It was crazy. Wow. That's absolutely wonderful. I, 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 I really, really love that. Yeah, it was well, fun. Brian, we're, we're at the point in the show that uh, I would like to, to hit you with the fast five and uh, if you're up for it and, uh, and, and give you five quick, quick questions, social plates, fast five. Yeah, to, sure. Uh, Okay. Uh, to, to see how you how you do at this one. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> All okay. right. Ryan Chip, you ready for the fast five? I'm ready. Go for it. Absolutely. Well, first one I want to ask you of is what for you was the most special aircraft that you've ever, ever flown? Ooh, the most special aircraft I've ever flown. Probably would say the one that I first flew with my dad would be a 1011. Uh, in the airline world, but then the Citabria was what he taught me to fly in. So I got to say a Citabria takes the cake that I have one now because that's what I learned to fly in. That's what my dad taught me to fly in. That's what he beat me in the back of the head with from the back seat when I screwed up. Uh, I love the Citabria. It's a very capable and fun airplane. That's my favorite. Perfect. Quick pivot from I, also my my favorite, the L-1011, but to the Citabria because you got to get back to your roots. And I am hoping yeah. to find Absolutely. my way into that little guy too. Oh, That's right. I love that. It's, it's a, it was a pilot's airplane. This thing was a beautiful airplane to fly. Okay, question number two. What was the funniest teaching experience that you've ever had? <laughs> First one that comes to mind, and I've had many, I've had students really crack me up, was I was teaching um, one of my students how to fly an instrument approach for the first time. We were working on his instrument rating and we're tracking a localizer. And I told him this is going to be, you know, four times as sensitive as a VOR. Uh, and he's, he's over correcting. And I said, Hey, Hey, hey settle down. The localizer is very sensitive. And the first thing he does without even missing a beat is he goes, Oh, I'm so sorry. I apologize. I didn't mean to offend you. <laughs> and I was just losing it because he was, he got the wrong version of sensitive, <laughs> <laughs> but that cracked me up. So students do funny things. All right. Question number three. If you could go back in time just to re-experience, just to be there for the 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is, to some period or some moment in your aviation life, what would that be? In my aviation life? Yes. To re-experience? Re Can I say Mile High Club? Yes. <laughs> Mile High Club. First time when I entered the Mile High Club, I got to say I would go back and do that over again. <laughs> but I don't know how I'm going to make it last 15 minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, we will move quickly on to question number four then, which is probably connected to the exact same answer as question number three. But if there was one thing that you wish you knew back in your teens and 20s and you went back there to tell your younger self, what, what would that be? The one thing, and this is absolutely... It is related to the last question, but if I could tell myself back then when I was 
15, 16 years old that about girls or guys, if you're into that, but if you run, they'll chase. And if you chase, they'll run. And if I could have told myself that back then and known what I know now about that, um, it would have been an entirely different experience. Entirely different aviation career. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I might not have gotten to aviation. <laughs> okay. This one will keep to the aviation career. Last question. Okay. What was the most amazing thing in all these stories that you've told? What is the most amazing thing that you ever saw during that time, during your aviation career? The most amazing thing, I believe, I didn't tell you about, but I did get to fly the uh, Space Shuttle Orbiter Simulator with uh, Charlie Precourt. He was the chief astronaut mm. at the time, and I was fortunate enough to tag along with Dad while he was writing an article about it and got to fly the simulator of the Space Shuttle Orbiter and, and learn some fantastic things, and it's experience that I, I will never forget. That is... Oh, you couldn't have a better answer than than that. And and what a great segue since Charlie is coming on the show in two weeks. <laughs> oh, good for him. Awesome. I look forward to that. He's a great guy. And and also a proponent of teaching people how and when it is okay or not okay to do the uh, engine failure turn back after takeoff. That's something that uh, that he and I have both taken uh, taken to task. And it's it's an important topic to study. But yeah mm, absolutely well brian i hope you will uh as always please 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 come back on we have just barely scratched the surface there oh my i'll tell you to everyone who's listening tonight we could go for for a day we could go for two days with the, well, I've with learned the stories a lot. that are here I, I have learned a lot and and i know that some regard me as successful i don't see it that way i'm, I'm I, I just i don't understand that but i think what i would regard as successful is having earned the credibility to give back to my time in the furtherance of aviation education. I love teaching. It's why I do, did I say fourflightworkshops.com? Um, yeah. I'm not benefiting. I'm not trying to make money doing it. I enjoy giving back and teaching and the credibility of the experiences that I've had give me that ability to do so. Mm. That makes so much sense. And I, 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 I treasure you both as a friend and everything that you add to aviation. And so I'm grateful that you've taken the time to come here tonight. And I hope we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Have a wonderful evening. All right. You too. Good night. Take care. And to all of you, thank you so much for everything that you do for aviation and for taking time out of your evening to join us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back next Tuesday, March 26th, with Janice Sullivan. Uh, I'll tell you, the, uh, her solar flight she did uh, quite a long time ago was the first time, you can go look this up, that first time that, uh, uh, that an aircraft was uh, completed a flight completely powered by solar. Uh, and it's an interesting segue from that to where we are today with uh, pushing the boundaries of electric aircraft. Uh, it, it really, really should be a wonderful story. So I'm looking forward to having her here on the show. Tuesday, April 2nd, as we mentioned, astronaut Charlie Precourt is going to be on talking about meeting Russia in space, a time when we were really bridging a lot of these um, uh, divides between the two countries, which I think is especially relevant now when tensions seem to be so high. And then uh, we're off for Sun and Fun, which will be a ton of fun. And you'll see some videos from us from down there at the show. And then back on Tuesday, April 16th, with EAA President Jack Pelton here with an EA Air Adventure preview. Until next time, I'm Jeff Simon for Social Flight. Blue skies.